Hello and welcome back to another YouTube video tutorial. Today's tutorial is going to be about how to do an MIS final presentation. Well, the topic is going to be e-learning and virtual classrooms. First, we will have to define what is e-learning. E-learning is an online self-paced learning commonly with instructor facilitation independent of geographic location and time. Who hasn't been in his house trying to learn piano or guitar or something and just YouTube a tutorial. That's e-learning. Virtual classroom. A virtual classroom is a bridging geographic regions between learning requirements and delivery. Virtual classrooms offer classes where time, distance or both separate students from their instructors. The tools virtual classrooms may include are online calendars, search engines, online help guides, online grading books, exams, quizzes. I think that all of us in this classroom can think about one virtual classroom we all use. That's right. Blackboard, it's a virtual classroom. Now we will talk about the history of e-learning. In 1924, the first testing machine was made. Ohio State University professor Sidney Percy invented the automatic teacher, the first device in electronic learning. It was an abysmal failure. <laughs> in 1954, the first teaching machine. The Harvard professor Skinner created this machine for schools. In 1960, computer-based training. Uh, there was a program logic automatic teaching operation operator called Plateau. It was the first computer-based training program. Then in 1966, CAI in schools, the Stanford University psychology professor Patrick and Richard began using computer aid instruction to teach math and reading to young children in Polo Alta elementary schools. In 1969, the ARPANET heralds internet. The U.S. Department of Defense commissioned ARPANET to create the internet. Going on, in 1970, the computer mouse was created and GUI, helping to define modern computing. In 1980s, the first Mac was created. The personal computer era begins with Macintosh. Online communities begin sharing information, slowly paving the way toward e-learning. In 1990s, the first digital natives are born. Email takes off. It's the dawn of a new era in learning. Virtual learning environments begin, and e-learning becomes a widely recognized term. In the 2000s, business began rolling out learning courses as a central way to train workers. Authoring tools are more accessible than ever, and a wide range of online learning opportunities are available. In the 2010s and uh, after that, a new wave of e-learning inspired by social media builds momentum, YouTube, Twitter, massive open online courses, iTunes, Skype. Opportunities to connect, share information, and learn from others are found everywhere. As of now, the most dominant and obvious forms of e-learning would be online classes. The book, Changing Courses, 10 Years of Tracking Online Education in the United States, surveyed over 2,800 academic leaders in 2012 in order to find the current status of online courses. Here are some of their findings. In this column, you can see the large increase in the percentage of college students enrolled in an online course. And down here, you can see that 6.7 million students were enrolled in one online course in the fall semester alone. This combination of web-based technology and education is known as blended learning. This is comprised of live virtual classrooms, self-paced instruction, collaborative learning, and streaming video, audio, or text to accomplish an educational goal. Here you can see some of the main reasons schools and corporations are beginning to advance towards a blended learning system. The top three over here would be to improve the ability to personalize learning, there's a potential for individual progress, and to improve student engagement and motivation. Margaret Driscoll, a consultant for the technology corporation IBM, stated, Using blended learning benefits the learner, the training staff, and the organization's bottom line. 
Blended learning allows organizations to gradually move learners from traditional classrooms to e-learning in small steps, making change easier to accept. Here at Wesleyan, we are all taking this first step into e-learning with the use of Blackboard. As you all know, we are given access to assignments, additional class content, and even the gradebook. This really allows for us to take advantage of technological advancements and apply them towards our education. Other schools have been taking a more aggressive approach towards e-learning that could possibly change all formal classroom settings. The idea is called a flipped classroom, and essentially this is exactly what the name implies. A flipped classroom inverts the traditional system, providing online lectures that can be viewed at home and allotting class time for assignments and activities. Here students are given the opportunity to learn at their pace and communicate with peers and teachers through online discussions, then apply what they have learned towards assignments and activities within the actual classroom. Online classes, course management systems such as Blackboard, and ideas like the flipped classroom are just a few of the ways in which the education systems are fusing with technology, and research shows no signs of slowing. In the article, Top 10 e-learning statistics for 2014, Christopher Pappas outlines how the e-learning industry is brighter than ever. As you can see, global spending towards e-learning has increased $20.6 billion from 2011 to 2013, and is expected to be over $100 billion by next year. Major corporations found that they were able to save both time and money when they made the change from instructor-based training to some sort of e-learning. It has been projected that over half of all college classes will be e-learning based by 2019. Here you can see that e-learning is not restricted to the United States. It has high annual growth rates that are projected to produce massive amounts of money throughout Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. This allows for businesses and schools to tap into the knowledge from some of the brightest minds throughout the world. This has been seen with the development of MOOCs or massive open online courses. Essentially, these are open lectures that, from some of the most prestigious universities around the world. For example, here's a course on computer science from Harvard University. So my name is David Malin, and this is CS50. So I absolutely love this course. I, this, for me, is my dream job, to be honest, now teaching this course, because I took this course myself about 11, 12 years ago when I was a sophomore. And I actually came into Harvard not even as a computer science major-minded person, but I started off as gov. I had exited high school thinking I liked history, I liked con, uh, constitutional law, and so sort of the natural progression once I got here seemed to be to go into the gov department. And I spent freshman fall, freshman spring, even sophomore fall biting off a lot of the requirements for that department, and it was really at the last... So as you can see, this is an actual instructor at Harvard University teaching a course in computer science. I don't know about all of you, but I don't think I would have ever imagined I would be listening to a Harvard lecture. It's exciting to think about how incredible of a resource this could be as we could spread and receive knowledge from some of the most intelligent people. But the most amazing thing about these e-learning techniques is that once students are provided with the information, their retention rates have the possibility of rising up to 60%, showing that e-learning is much more effective when it comes to how much knowledge is acquired during the learning process. Now that we've discussed some terms in e-learning basics as well as some history, we'll finish up by talking about the future of e-learning. Einstein said, Your imagination is a preview of coming attractions. Years ago, learning was the equivalent of copying and memorizing from physical books. Back then, I'm sure it was difficult to comprehend and imagine how far we've come with the internet and learning. So what does the future hold? In an article by Dana Rosen titled, E-Learning Future, What Will E-Learning Look Like in 2075? She said that we can only imagine an increased use of MOOCs or massive open online courses, virtual technologies, and mobile learning. 
We'll touch on these as well as another in a little bit after we go over a few projected statistics and what benefits from e-learning the future will provide us. On to the statistics. Currently, 46% of college students are taking at least one class that involves e-learning, and this will be up to 50%, probably more, by the year 2019. Also, over 40% of global Fortune 500 companies are using e-learning, and this is increasing each year. Uh, example, Northwestern Mutual, which is number 110 on the list of 500, uses a program called ExamFX, which is a series of study materials, both online and an application for your iPhone, that enable you to study for your licensing exams for both insurance retirement and securities. Now we're going to talk about a few things that e-learning will allow us to do in the future. First, feedback. Most modern technology gives teachers and managers, as well as students and employees, instant and timely feedback, which can be used to pinpoint where the learner and the course itself need to improve. Second, more personalized courses. Teachers and managers can now see how individuals are learning best, which will result in more personalized and engaging courses. Modules can be custom tailored to fit individual needs of the learner, and sometimes the course program does this itself. itself. For example, Northwestern Mutual, with their securities exam, the questions that you miss on the chapter quizzes are then funneled into the flashcards that you can use right before you take the exam. Third, tracking learner patterns. We can easily track learners from start to finish now. Uh, this will help determine which course or courses are improving retention and which ones are irrelevant. Then, decision makers can decide where to devote their resources to the courses and or aspects that are being effective. We can then learn about the individual learners and the learning groups as a whole. Now we're going to talk about some trends that we could expect to see in the future. First, MOOCs, or Massive Open Online Courses, which are closed licensing for course materials. Currently this is free for students, but it may not be in the future. Uh, Georgia Tech recently unveiled the first all MOOC computer science degree, which is roughly $7,000, which is a heck of a lot cheaper than what we're paying. Another uh, trend that we can expect to see is mobile learning or M-learning. Online courses will be accessible on mobile devices. Um, there's a couple examples that one of them from eLearningIndustry.com and one of them from myself. First, a teacher could theoretically take a class on a little trip. They could take measurements, make calculations, and then input into mobile devices. And they could use this data as part of the next lesson in class. This is real world and it's practical. Another example is Northwestern Mutual with their exam FX program uses mobile learning because it allows you to take the flashcards and the chapter quizzes with you on the go. A third trend that we could expect to see, virtual technologies. Uh, first example, Google Glass, which basically makes you RoboCop. Very cool. Um, immersive multimedia is what they called it on eLearningIndustry.com. Uh, the future can incorporate more recreated sensory experiences because people learn in different ways. And the fourth most common trend that we can expect to see in the future that I found with the research that I did, gamification. Basically, simulated games are involved in the courses. This enables controlled problem solving and strategy development, and you have immediate feedback with a reward, which can include points, badges, or virtual currency, for example. All right, now I've got a timeline to go over. This timeline was created in 2012, so bear with me. 2013, the LMS market surpasses 600. Basically, the LMS is Learning Management Systems market, or the e-learning market, surpasses 600 different textbooks that are available online. 2014, halfway through, digital textbooks become the norm. Online learning in K-12 follows suit. I would say that this is not the case yet, but it will happen shortly. Uh, I would say that probably almost 90% of textbooks that you buy now, at least the modern ones, have an online version that includes both, um, both the actual textbook itself and then some chapter quizzes and tests and things to help you. Uh, 2015, learning comes your way via gaming devices and media centers at home. Uh, this hasn't happened yet, but I assume it will shortly. Um, 
2016, continued evolution of mobile devices creates rapid transition of capabilities throughout e-learning. I definitely think that mobile devices and e-learning are going hand in hand at this point, and I think that it will only continue to improve and increase. And in 2020, hybrid systems come into focus, driven by emerging technology and customer need, customer need. I do believe that this will happen, but it's hard to tell when. So, what does this mean for the future of schools and teachers? Peter Drucker said, Universities won't survive. The future is outside the traditional campus, outside the traditional classroom. I think there's a lot of truth in this. So, what are a few benefits for teachers? E-learning could, and this is from elearningindustry.com. I believe they stole a few of these from a speech that Bill Gates gave. E-learning could, theoretically, polish up subpar teaching, provide equality across socioeconomic groups, eliminate geographic barriers, and make learning more exciting.